much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. John Shrigley, the pathology lead at the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer and the chief in, of the program of lab medicine and genetics at Trillium Health Partners in Mississauga. On behalf of the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, Cancer Ontario, and the Canadian Association of Pathologists, I would like to welcome everyone to today's CAP Cancer Protocol Education Session on Lung Cancer. Before I introduce our speaker and we get underway, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping items. First session is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be circulated to all participants via email when it becomes available. Both the live presentation and the recorded version are eligible for CME credits. Information for obtaining credits can be found in the session notice. But please note that CME certificates for each education session will only be issued for one month from the presentation date. Please refer to the session notice for more details. Please, everyone's line has been automatically muted for today's presentation. We have a large number of participants and will not be able to troubleshoot WebEx issues as part of this call. If you're experiencing technical difficulties, please call the WebEx support line. I encourage you to submit questions at any time during the presentation using the chat feature within WebEx. The chat instructions can also be found in the session notice question and answer portion of the presentation, a session moderator will pose the submitted questions on your behalf for as long as time permits and in the order in which they, were, they are received. In that window, please include the following information, your institution's name, the name of the individual posing the question, and finally your question. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Wong. David is a pulmonary pathologist at UHN and associate professor uh, in the uh, Department of uh, Lab Medicine and Pathobiology at University of Toronto. He did his residency in anatomical pathology at U of T and trained in pulmonary pathology at both Toronto General and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He has published and taught extensively in the pulmonary field. He served uh, in a number of lung cancer-related working groups for Cancer Care Ontario and currently serves as the chair of the Lung Cancer Pathology and Staging Expert Review Panel for the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer and is also our Canadian representative on the College of American Pathologists Pulmonary and Media Panel Cancer Protocol Review Panel. Without any further ado, I introduce you to Dr. Wong to give today's talk on lung cancer. David? Uh, much appreciated. Good afternoon, everyone, or for those who are calling in from BC, uh, I guess good morning. Um, thanks to uh, John and, and CCO and CPAC for uh, inviting me to speak today on the uh, AP lung cancer checklists. Uh, these are my disclosures. Okay, so objectives for uh, the next hour and a half or so are fairly straightforward. First of all, I want to review the CAP lung cancer protocol, really emphasizing uh, potential changes that are probably going to be coming up in the uh, next update. And uh, as part of that, the second objective will be to review uh, the eighth edition of the TNM classification for lung cancers and uh, touch on some of the potential impacts of uh, this new staging system on uh, staging of lung cancers. Okay, as uh, no doubt you're all aware, uh, cancer remains one of the 10 leading causes of death worldwide. So 15 years ago, it was number nine on the list, and 15 years from now, uh, it's anticipated that it will rise several spots to, to number six. Look at the incidence and mortality caused by lung cancer. This is U.S. data, um, but look at trends from 1975 till 2012. You can see that the incidence and mortality on a population-wide scale in the U.S. peaked somewhere in the early to mid-90s and has been uh, somewhat declining since then. Looking at data from CPAC, uh, you can see a similar trend for at least incidence and mortality in males. Looks like the incidence and mortality of lung cancer has been somewhat declining in males since the early 1990s. However, in females, it seems to have been creeping upwards, uh, maybe reaching a plateau somewhere uh, over the past decade, hopefully. Looking at uh, comparing lung cancer with uh, cancer incidents and deaths from uh, some of the major 
uh, other major causes of cancer. Uh, so looking at incidence, estimated new cases in 2016 in the U.S., again, this is American data, um, lung cancer was second only to breast cancer in terms of the number of new cases. But when you look at mortality, you see that lung cancer uh, is estimated to have caused more deaths in 2016 uh, than uh, breast, colorectal, and prostate cancer combined, uh, the next big three. Uh, no doubt lung cancer continues to be uh, a major health issue on a population-wide scale. Uh, reasons for this uh, higher mortality rate, uh, the other cancers, is apparent in this slide here where you see that with comparing five-year survival rates between lung, breast, and prostate, uh, whereas since 1975, there's been a uh, very good uh, five-year survival in breast and prostate uh, cancers from 75% in breast in 1975 to about 90% uh, in 2008, and kind of a, an even more impressive increase in five-year survival in prostate cancer over the same period. Uh, there has been some increase in survival in lung cancer from 1975 to 2008, but really uh, nowhere in the same ballpark as either breast or prostate cancer. In terms of cancer management, um, as we everyone is aware, molecular profiling of lung tumors is really becoming increasingly important in personalized treatment of lung cancer looking for things like EGFR mutations, uh, new rearrangements in ALK or ROS1, um, recently, you know, onset PDL1 testing. Uh, not going to be talking about these at all. This is a really completely separate talk. Unfortunately, we won't be touching on this. But what I do want to talk about is how management of cancer really is still based largely on tumor stage and histologic type. And as you know, tumor stage is uh, according to the NAM classification system up till very recently, the seventh edition. Now the uh, eighth edition has been published. And the logic type at present is according to the WHO 2015 classification. Now turn attention to the CAP lung cancer protocol. The current version uh, 3.4 was released in 2016. And the major revision uh, at that time was full incorporation of, of the 2015 WHO classification. Um, parts of that classification had been implemented previously, uh, at least for adenocarcinomas, uh, but in the current version, we, we now have uh, <clears throat> pretty much the entire WHO 2015 classification. Left version of a revision, uh, version 4.0, was uh, released for public comment, I think, in late October or early November 2016. And uh, it, in the goal was, I think, for release uh, of this on January 1st of this year. However, uh, due to delay of implementation of the TNM 8th edition by the AJCC to January, 21st, uh, January 1st of 2018, um, the release of the CAP uh, version of the lung protocol has also been delayed uh, with the target release date of late quarter of 2017, so uh, hopefully by the end of June. And uh, this delay, I guess, is really intended to try to permit uh, vendors to you know, make the updates that are needed uh, for the uh, TNM 8th edition. summarize some of the key changes that uh, were part of the draft written that was released in or that was put out for public comment in um, October or November of 2016, uh, recognizing that there may be additional uh, versions, I guess, based on the comments that were received back. We just want to touch on some of the major uh, visions. <clears throat> Some major revisions in that draft version uh, was to tumor size, <clears throat> and I'll talk a lot more about this later talk, but really specifically the addition of fields for measuring uh, total tumor size as well as invasive 
tumor size. There are some changes to uh, the field related to tumor focality, uh, clarification of terminology for intrapulmonary metastases and synchronous primaries, and addition of a couple new categories in the tumor focality section, namely multifocal lung adenocarcinoma with lipidic features and diffuse pneumonic type adenocarcinoma. Also, a few minor revisions to the histologic type, which I'll discuss again in more detail later. Um, the, the fields have been added, first of all, to allow indication of additional adenocarcinoma subtypes. Since of so called spread through airspaces or STAS pattern for adenocarcinomas, and uh, an additional field for indication of combined large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, that is, uh, large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma with a component of uh, some other sort of non small cell carcinoma. Uh, to extension fields, there's been a number of minor uh, changes to removal of the mediastinal pleura from tumor extension. Uh, the two centimeter distance from carina um, for tumor involving the main bronchus was also removed, which I'm sure probably many pathologists are going to be quite happy about, and the uh, addition of the recurrent laryngeal nerve within the checklist. Uh, Martin's were uh, also two minor revisions, really just the addition of Xenoma in situ descriptors for the parenchymal margin, and a few other minor revisions to treatment effect and tumor-associated atelectasis fields. The major change in the upcoming draft version, or uh, how is the, uh, I guess, incorporation of the eighth edition TNM staging classification, and, and we'll speak uh, in some detail about this soon. Okay, so getting into the protocol itself, just running quickly through the draft, and I would reiterate that this was just a draft version that was posted for public comment. There may be a, a few additional changes. Uh, when the full version is released based on the public comments that have been received. Uh, I don't really think that there should be really major changes based uh, compared to what I'm presenting today. Uh, looking at the specimen in, uh, information fields, really there's no change to any of these, whether it's specimen type, laterality, procedure, or tumor site. Tumor size, however, when we get to the tumor information fields, tumor size has uh, changed. And uh, <clears throat> here the tumor size as applying to histologic types other than non-mucinous adenocarcinoma. Uh, in other words, for mucinous adenocarcinomas, the tumor size measurements remain pretty much the same as, as the current version. However, for non-mucinous adenocarcinomas, there are now two new fields. First of all, for total tumor size and for invasive tumor size. And once again, this applies to non-mucinous adenocarcinomas, which is really the large majority of uh, adenocarcinomas. The reason for this change is that, as we'll see, the T staging going forward with the athogen is to be based on the invasive component only for mucinous adenocarcinomas. For mucinous adenocarcinomas, it's still the tumor size, including lipidic and invasive components. Components, but for nuisance adenocarcinomas, uh, staging will be based on invasive tumor size, not the total tumor size. Uh, so, and imagine this may present some difficulties and complications, and I don't think any of us will really fully understand the impact until we've had some time to start uh, reporting this with total and, and invasive tumor sizes. But the idea is that prognosis of these tumors seems to be uh, related primarily with the invasive component and not so much with the lipidic components. Uh, so really at the risk of overstaging, um, the uh, I guess the decision had been made that really staging should be based on the invasive component. For smaller tumors, uh, that should pose no problem. So if you have tumors that can fit on one or two slides, Generally, you can um, identify the lipidic and invasive components uh, microscopically. You can mark them, 
and measure them directly on the slide. So minimally invasive adenocarcinomas or uh, smaller lipidic predominant adenocarcinomas, um, <clears throat> onset measurement uh, is feasible. So here's one example of a uh, lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma where we're able to get a full cross-section of, of the tumor. And you can see that the t total tumor size in this case was in one millimeters uh, measured on the glass slide. Uh, there was a small invasive component in this case, and on the slide it measured seven millimeters. So for small tumors like this, it probably would be much of a problem. Uh, I guess it'll be a more effort than uh, things presently are, but uh, should be fairly straightforward. For tumors, however, this uh, may be a little bit more challenging. And the proposal for larger tumors that are too large to fit on a, one or two slides um, is to multiply the total tumor size by the percentage of the invasive components in order to estimate the inv invasive tumor size. <clears throat> to show a couple of examples of this, let's say we have a 3.6 centimeter tumor that we've measured grossly, and so logically uh, we've find that there's approximately 80% ATAR and 20% lipidic components. Uh, the invasive tumor size in this situation would be 80%. Uh, it's the invasive ASNR component, uh, not counting the lipidic components. So the invasive tumor size would be 80% times 3.6, which uh, would be 2.9 centimeters. Uh, if the proportions in this 3.6 uh, 3 centimeter tumor are flipped uh, so that we're looking at 80% lipidic and 20% asinar, uh, then the invasive tumor size in this case then becomes 20%, which corresponds to the asinar component only, times 0.6, and so is 0 0.7 centimeters. Uh, we'll talk a little more about the impact on staging, but as you can appreciate, uh, this represents quite a major departure from the way that we've, most of us have been uh, staging these tumors uh, up to this point or assessing size of these tumors uh, to this point. Uh, another example, if there's a 6.0 centimeter tumor with 90% asinar and 10% micropapillary, so this is complete invasive tumor with no lipid component, well, the invasive tumor size is just the same as the total tumor size 6.0 centimeters. With a 6 centimeter tumor, if, as is the case often with uh, lung adenocarcinomas, there are multiple different patterns, let's say 40% asinar, 20% papillary, 10% solid, and 3% lipidic, so in total 70% invasive, the tumor size would be calculated as 7% times 6 centimeters. Uh, cooling 4.2 centimeters in total. Uh, another thing to note in terms of invasive uh, tumor size assessment, uh, for scars that are present within tumors generally are included in the assessment of invasive size, uh, the exceptions being if there's you know, clear, uh, a non-tumor related cause of the scarring identified or if there's only small foci of carcinoma at the edge of an otherwise benign appearing scar. Moving on to tumor focality, uh, the version of um, things that we've seen in oncologic reviews or personal consultations, I, I think sometimes the etiology of separate tumor nodules is perhaps a little bit confusing to some pathologists. And especially given that the synchronous primary and intrapulmonary metastases fields are considered optional in, in the current version, uh, sometimes there's some question as to whether uh, separate tumor nodules uh, really represent synchronous primaries or intrapulmonary metastases. The draft version uh, that was released late last year, there's been some attempt to uh, clarify the terminology and separate out Pulmonary metastases you know, defy a same histopathologic type, whether in the same or in different lobes, uh, really to clarify intrapulmonary mets from synchronous primary 
uh, uh, whether, again, in the same or different lobes. Uh, major change to the tumor focality fields with addition of these two fields here for multifocal lung adenocarcinoma with lipidic features and fused pneumonic type adenocarcinoma. So first of all, just addressing the issue of multiple separate tumor nodules. Uh, in a situation where you've got different histologic subtypes, uh, so whether you've got uh, one nodule being squamous cell carcinoma or, and, and another nodule being adenocarcinoma, uh, that's clearly synchronous primaries. But they're also uh, applied to situations where two tumors have different predominant adenocarcinoma, uh, adenocarcinoma subtypes. So for example, if one tumor is ASNAR, uh, adenocarcinoma and the other one is papillary predominant. Uh, generally, these would be considered synchronous primaries. However, when there's um, the same or very similar histologic subtypes, uh, distinction between synchronous primaries and metastatic uh, or intrapulmonary metastases may actually be quite challenging. Uh, I think probably that's that we have at this point. I would refer you to this article by Gerard et al. in 2009 in surgical, uh, American Journal of Surgical Pathology uh, on comprehensive histologic assessment uh, and approach to uh, differentiating a primary versus metastatic. And recently, last year, there was a, a paper in the Journal of Thoracic Oncology, which uh, really kind of relied only on this 2009 ASP paper, uh, but added a few other things. So uh, I'm not going to talk about this differentiation too much at, at this point would refer you to these papers. In terms of multifocal lung adenocarcinoma with lipidic features, this uh, is referring to a situation where in either a lobectomy or a pneumonectomy, uh, there are multiple uh, lipid predominant tumors. Uh, logically, these typically present as multiple subsolid nodules, whether pure ground glass opacities or part solid nodules, or some combination of both. Logically, um, probably all of, all of us have seen, uh, you can have oftentimes multiple tumors that are on the AIS, MIA, and the lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma spectrum. Typically, in this situation, um, except for mucinous adenocarcinoma, for non mucinous lipidic predominant adenocarcinomas, these would typically be considered synchronous primaries. And so these tumors uh, doesn't change in that uh, the staging would be based on the highest T stage lesion with uh, the M suffix or the number of lesions indicated in, in parentheses uh, after the tumor stage. And uh, <clears throat> would refer to another article um, in the same issue of thoracic oncology uh, for some discussion of, of the situation where you've got multifocal uh, lung adenocarcinoma with lipidic features. The pneumonic type adenocarcinoma is uh, another field that's been added. And uh, I guess it would be classically what was called BAC, or bronchiolar alveolar type carcinoma, which is uh, getting no longer in widespread. Uh, radiologically, this uh, consists of patchy or diffuse consolidations of a lobe or sometimes of, of the whole lung. <clears throat> Logically, grossly, we can see consolidation. And microscopically, this is characterized by diffuse involvement of either a lobe or, or a lung by cells demonstrating the same histology throughout. Often, these adenocarcinomas would be mucinous type. On occasion, you can see pneumonic type adenocarcinoma for non mucinous adenocarcinoma. Uh, adenocarcinomas as well. Just show one example, this was um, a pneumectomy specimen of a patient with invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma. And you can see in the lower zones, well, the entire lower lobe and, and you know, the part of the upper lobe uh, is completely consolidated grossly uh, with maybe a little bit of a normal lung in, in the upper zones. And histologically, this was all invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma. Okay, on to histologic types. 
Um, the histologic types themselves really have not changed because uh, the WHO 2015 classification is already in effect. Further, there have been uh, a few things that have been added. Uh, first of all, there's a new field uh, to uh, allow specification of the different non-predominant adenocarcinoma histologic subtypes that are present. And really, this is important because uh, now that we're going to be <clears throat> needing to estimate the invasive tumor size um, based on the invasive opponents, uh, it probably be important to have some sort of documentation uh, of the non-predominant logic subtypes that were used to do that calculation. And then an optional field here uh, as well to indicate the presence of spread through air spaces. a quick reminder of the uh, current adenocarcinoma subtypes. We've got lipidic predominant you know, with a or lipidic type pattern where you've got uh, surface growth of tumor cells on alveolar septa. Our uh, histologic type where you've got formation of these uh, I guess structures with central lumens. Uh, one thing I would note is that the cribriform pattern, which is becoming increasingly recognized and maybe associated with poor prognostic uh, features. Uh, currently, there's no separate uh, site that's designated for that in the WHO classification or in the CAP protocol. And so that would be currently still subsumed under the ASINAR subtype. Then we have capillary with the finger-like projections, fibrovascular cores lined by tumor cells, uh, type and micropapillary where you've got the uh, powdery tufts without the fibrovascular cores. Now, subtyping is important for various reasons, um, <clears throat> not the least of which is that there's been a number of studies showing that adenocarcinoma subtype seems to predict survival, uh, as shown in this 2011 paper in the Journal of Thoracic Oncology, where lipidic predominant, or MIA or AIS, uh, has very good survival. Um, where solid or micropapillary, considered poorly differentiated tumors, have poor survival, and the more moderately differentiated subtypes, being asner and papillary, are somewhere in the middle. More recently, however, there was a paper published in 2015 that suggests that adenosinoma subtype may also predict benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. <clears throat> so, in this paper, uh, published by uh, my colleague Ming Hao and, and his colleagues here in Toronto, showing that uh, for and, and papillary uh, type adenocarcinomas, there really didn't seem to be much uh, benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy uh, with respect to disease free survival. But when you look at micropapillary and solid type tumors, a uh, patient receiving uh, chemotherapy, the uh, line here uh, exhibited better the disease-free survival compared to those who uh, did not receive any chemotherapy. The spread through airspaces field. Uh, spread through airspaces is, is a relatively new concept, and uh, this refers to the presence of tumor cells, either single cells or small clusters of cells, uh, that are within airspaces beyond the edge of the tumor. Perhaps a controversial um, <clears throat> concept, and there have been a number of people who have uh, questioned whether this is actually a real phenomenon or if it's just uh, an artifact. Um, but it seems to be uh, gaining increased acceptance uh, in the lung pathology community. Just an example here where you've got lung part here, and here we've got a few micropapillary tufts, tumor cells. Uh, with their spaces, and, and this is beyond the edge of, of the tumor. The reason that this is significant is that in multiple studies, uh, the presence of STAS seems to be associated with increased recurrence rates as well as poor prognosis. And so um, the upcoming draft of, of the C lung cancer protocol, it's recommended to report this uh, when it's present. However, it should be noted that S is not included when um, you're looking at different percentages of subtypes. 
So if there's a bit of what looks like micropapillary tufting here um, in your stas component, but no micropapillary component elsewhere, uh, this dot um, this would not be considered uh, micropapillary uh, for the purpose of determining percentages of the subtypes. Uh, <clears throat> and here's just a couple articles from 2015 uh, talking about the increased recurrence rate and poor prognosis in patients that exhibit stas. That seems to be quite a strong predictor. Moving through the histologic type, uh, minimally invasive adenocarcinomas and AIS. There's really no difference in how we, uh, or no change in how we report these. I'd remind you that minimally invasive adenocarcinomas are lipidic predominant tumors that are up to three centimeters in total tumor size, but less than or equal to uh, half a centimeter in invasive size uh, without either visceral pleural invasion, muscular invasion, without any stas, or without necrosis. As we'll see later, uh, in the eighth edition, uh, these are staged as PTMI for minimally invasive. Carcinomas in sub two are exclusively lipidic tumors than or equal to three centimeters in total tumor size without any inv evidence of invasion. And uh, in the eighth edition, these would be staged formally as PTIS. Uh, cell carcinomas, uh, really not much change from the current, uh, slowly with neuroendocrine uh, tumors, other than the addition of, of this field to indicate combined large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. And then for carcinoma types, uh, large cell carcinoma, sarcomatoid carcinomas, adenosquamous, uh, salivary gland type tumors, uh, for epithelioma like carcinoma and nut carcinoma, again, no change from the current uh, CAP protocol. Uh, just point out that bidding tumors aren't uh, included in the CAP checklist. These are only for carcinomas. Histologic grading, it remains uh, optional at this point because it's largely still a work in progress. Um, I mean, there seems to be some movement towards a consensus in how we grade different tumors, but there's still uh, a lot of work that needs to be done on this. <clears throat> the things that most people would agree on is small cell carcinomas and large cell carcinomas should be graded as undifferentiated tumors, or G4. Asteroid carcinomas, if they have any focal squamous or glandular differentiation, uh, as in the pleomorphic carcinomas, uh, these would be considered uh, poorly differentiated tumors or grade three. Or if there's no squamous or glandular differentiation, these would be considered undifferentiated carcinomas. For carcinomas, there's been a number of different proposals out there looking at different parameters. Uh, one proposal that seems to be widely in use is that lipidic predominant tumors would be considered uh, G1. Or well differentiated, our and papillary tumors would be considered moderately differentiated, or G2, and solid and micropapillary tumors would be considered poorly differentiated, or G3. And these would, would kind of correlate with uh, the graph that I've shown previously in correlation of, of these subtypes with either survival or response to chemotherapy. Cell carcinoma, really, there's, there's no widely accepted. Uh, way of grading these tumors. I think most people would say that if there's extensive keratinization, we consider those well differentiated. <clears throat> if uh, we can hardly tell that it's square cell, then it would be poorly differentiated. Moderately differentiated would be sort of everything in between. Uh, again, there's been a number of studies in recent years <clears throat> looking at different parameters for staging of squamous cell carcinomas, and we expect to see more uh, in the coming years. Uh, one par parameter that seems to be of some interest. Uh, row is uh, the whole uh, tumor budding, uh, whether there's kind of inflammation at the edges of uh, nests of various sizes or single cells, and this may be of some prognostic significance. But uh, we'll look forward to sort of more studies in the coming years on uh, grading and, and hopefully sort of consensus uh, sometime soon. Uh, so the tumor extension fields, uh, visceral pleural invasion field hasn't changed. Uh, the tumor extension fields uh, have changed uh, minimally, 
as I mentioned, uh, to remove the greater than or less than two centimeter uh, distance from carina uh, suffocation for tumors invading, uh, invading the main stem bronchus. Uh, note that this is without involvement of the carina because carinal invasion remains a separate field. The recent laryngeal nerve has always been part of, or has been part of the 7th edition TNM classification, but uh, so it's been missed in previous versions of the protocol, so it's been added uh, in this draft. A final plura, it's, I think it was felt that this was sometimes a little bit difficult to identify or delineate, and uh, so that field has been removed. <clears throat> On to margins, uh, really not much change at all uh, to the margin status fields. Really the only changes are the addition of carcinoma in situ to the parenchymal margin fields, and really this is to accommodate uh, adenocarcinoma in situ. Uh, parameters, um, <clears throat> just minimal changes for treatment effect. Now there's addition of a not applicable field. So it looks like this is probably going to be a mandatory field going forward, as opposed to uh, an optional one. And uh, tumor-associated atelectasis or obstructive pneumonitis, whereas there used to be two fields here for, for atelectasis extending to the hilar re region involving only part of the lung and a second one for involving all of the lung. Based on the staging classification, these have been collapsed into a single field. An LI and extranodal extension uh, has not changed. Okay. Okay, I'd like to spend just the last minutes of this talk <clears throat> talking about the 8th edition TNM classification, which really is the major change in the uh, new version of the CAP protocol. Uh, I note again that uh, uh, cancer classification applies only to carcinomas, uh, not to sarcomas or lymphomas or other kind of rare tumors like primary melanoma of the lung or, or so forth. And this classification applies both also to small cell carcinoma and to carcinoid tumors. Now, Previously, uh, the 8th edition was initially scheduled for implementation uh, January 1st of this year. However, in mid-November, the AJCC put out a statement <clears throat> saying that implementation JCC was going to be delayed until January 1st, 2018, and was in order to ensure that the cancer care community has the necessary infrastructure in, for documenting 8th edition stage. However, they also did say that clinicians will continue to use the latest information for patient care, including the scientific content of the 8th edition manual. Um, my view of this is that uh, this is a suggestion that you know, where possible, we should probably be uh, porting both stages uh, during the time of transition, uh, that uh, clinicians can use that in their decision making and I'll give some, some of my thoughts at the end of the talk about maybe how, what the best way to do this would be. Uh, because this delay, however, uh, the CAP protocol um, implement has, has also been pushed back. Note that I think the UICC has pushed forward with implementation as of January 1st this year, so I think Europe and other parts of the world have uh, probably switched to the 8th edition so in the US and probably here in Canada also where we're tied to the CAP protocols and our pathology reporting that uh, probably we will be beaded. Okay, just an overview of the major changes. I've already hinted at some of the T-stage uh, fields. Um, there's expanded use of the PTIS to include adenocarcinoma in situ. Uh, there's another TMI category for MIAs, changes in the tumor size cutoffs that are used to define the different stages, and I'll show examples of that shortly. And I mentioned previously, uh, at least for JCC recommendations, um, presently uh, use of invasive tumor size for T staging. Stage really hasn't changed at all in addition, 
but uh, the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer has recommended some subclassification, which I'll show uh, to the neural stations um, involved by tumor. And the stage, there's been a minor revision to add M1C category from multiple diff uh, distant metastases. Looking at the T stage fields, there's uh, a number of things just to highlight here. For all, as I mentioned, carcinoma in situ. Oops, sorry. Carcinoma in situ used to be just a generic field in the seventh edition. Now there's uh, famous carcinoma in situ and adenocarcinoma in situ added. Uh, previously, I think probably of us were using uh, the TS field primarily for squamous carcinoma in situ. Um, and there was a bit of question as to whether adenocarcinoma in two should be classified as TIS or T1A in the seventh edition. Well, the um, eighth edition, I guess there's no ambiguity that AIS is now classified as TIS. As I'd previously mentioned, TMI uh, for minimally invasive adenocarcinomas. And there's new size cutoffs for subclassification of T1 tumors. So T1 tumors remain tumors that are up to three centimeters in greatest dimension. However, the cutoffs are different. So T1A is now tumors that are less than or equal to one centimeter. And uh, as you know, in the seventh edition, uh, that cutoff is actually two centimeters. Whereas T1B tumors are now uh, one, two centimeters in size, whereas in the seventh edition, they were two to three centimeters. And then the new category of T1C uh, from two to three centimeters in size. And again, I would say this is invasive size. Uh, T2 tumors, as I've pointed out, the distance to corona, uh, the two centimeter distance has been removed. Um, previously, for tumors that were uh, later than centimeters, it was uh, still T2, whereas T3 would be uh, to within two centimeters of the carina, but prognostically, that dis distance doesn't seem to make a difference. So now it's just all classified as T2. And then mentioned the atelectasis or obstructive pneumonitis is now all classified as T2. Side offs for T2 tumors has also changed. Obviously, in the seventh or currently in the seventh edition, uh, tumors that are between three and seven centimeters in size are considered T2, but that's changed to three to five centimeters in size. Again, invasive size in the eighth edition, with TA tumors being from three to four centimeters, and QB tumors being from four to five centimeters. T3 and T4 size cutoffs has, have also changed. <clears throat> so whereas T3 used to be tumors that are greater than 7 centimeters, now 3 denotes tumors between 5 and 7 centimeters. And T4 is uh, what is used to designate tumors that are greater than 7 centimeters in size. Uh, the other elements of uh, T3 and T4 have not changed from the current 7th edition. Summarize the changes in size cutoffs. Um, everyone's familiar with the seventh edition cutoff, T1A being from zero to two centimeters, T1B from two to three, TA being three to five, T2B from five to seven, three being greater than seven. Uh, now, tumors between zero and five centimeters are sort of each have uh, their own T subcategory designation, three centimeters from 5 is T3, and greater than 7 is T4. Uh, again, note that in the T, uh, seventh edition, total size was used for a T stage, whereas the eighth edition, it's going to be invasive size that's used. And uh, as you may well imagine, use of invasive size for the eighth edition TNM may very well alter the T stage that you assign compared to if you're using to tumor size, and this will be especially true of lipidic predominant tumors. So, in that same lipidic predominant tumor that uh, I'd shown uh, slides ago, uh, total tumor size is 21 millimeters in the seventh edition. Currently, that would be staged as PT1B. 
uh, with the invasive component size <clears throat> of 7 millimeters under the addition, this would actually be staged as T1A. Those examples that I'd shown previously, 3.6 meter tumor with 80% asner and 20% lipidic. <clears throat> In the current edition, this would be a T2A tumor. However, an invasive tumor size of 2.9 centimeters would now be classified under the eighth edition as a T1C tumor. <clears throat> If you flip the proportions to 80% lipidic and 20% asinar in the same total tumor size, staging did not or does not change in the seventh edition. This will be considered a T2A tumor. However, in the eighth edition, the invasive tumor size, in this case, 20% of 3.6 is a little over 0.7 centimeters. And so uh, this was considered a T1A tumor in uh, the 8th edition. So you can see quite a, a large change compared to the 7th edition. The meter tumor that was 100% invasive in the 7th edition, this would be T2B based on the 6 centimeter size. However, in the 8th edition, this would be considered T3, so upstaged. However, if there's 30% lipidic and 70% invasive components, where in the 7th edition, it would be T2B still. In the 8th edition, uh, the basic tumor size is 4.2 centimeters and would still actually be stayed as T2B, but only because the size criteria for T2B have uh, changed somewhat from this edition. Okay, on to lymph nodes. Uh, again, as I mentioned, there's currently no change to lymph nodes in the draft version, and nodal stations remain uh, per the ISLC nodal chart. Now, the ISLC, however, has <clears throat> made a proposal for trying to subclassify uh, nodal disease to really try to quantitate the burden of disease uh, based on the number of stations involved. Uh, so this proposal is to really break down N1 and N2 disease into A and B categories, where N1A would be a station N1 involved, so whether that's uh, low bar lymph nodes or segmental lymph nodes or you know, uh, interlow bar. Um, multiple station involvement at N1 would be N1B. <clears throat> really, for N2, N2A would be single, uh, single station N2 disease. However, this would be sub subdivided into N2A1 and A2, where A1 would be single station N2 disease without any N1 disease detected, so this would be a so-called skip metastasis, and N2A2 would be single station N2 disease uh, with presence of verified N1 disease, and B would be multiple station N2 disease. And based on, I guess, the prelim preliminary analyses, it would seem that N1B and N2A1 have a similar prognosis. Uh, this is, uh, at this point anyways, I think still just a proposal. I believe that it's still under review, so it's, it's not currently in draft version 4.0. Uh, I'm not really expecting that it would be uh, in the final release later this year, <clears throat> but I guess this is something that, uh, that we'll have to keep an eye on. stage, uh, as I've mentioned previously, just one minor change where distant metastases were obviously lumped as M1B. Uh, M1B from the 7th edition has now been subdivided into M1B and M1B, denoting single extrathoracic metastases in a single organ or multiple extrathoracic whether in a single organ or in multiple organs. Finally, uh, other fields uh, in additional pathology findings and uh, ancillary studies uh, don't look like they're going to be changing the upcoming version. <clears throat> I don't have to discuss the lung biomarker template, but I would refer you to that if you're interested in finding out more about uh, biomarker studies. So that sort of wraps up the overview of the um, C draft version 4.0 protocol and the addition of the TNM. 
because there is going to be this transition period where we're waiting for our pathology LISs to uh, and the new CAP uh, protocols, I guess there have been a lot of questions about how we should be reporting these cancer resection cases in the interim uh, while those protocols are being changed over. Uh, so I'd like to offer a few suggestions on, on how to do this. Uh, first of all, uh, for now, I would suggest that we continue to report the seventh edition of the TNM in the diagnosis section of our reports. Uh, thinking behind this is uh, really try to avoid confusion where the, diagnostic sec the diagnosis section says one thing and the synoptic data section says something else potentially. I uh, really try to maintain concordance between the diagnosis section and the synoptic data fields. Um, so whatever version the CAP checklist in the synoptic data field is, probably better to uh, report that in, in the diagnosis section. And I think it'll be important to indicate which edition is being used. So in situation, uh, this is a PT2A and one tumor brackets, seventh edition TNM just to make it absolutely clear uh, As the CAP lung cancer protocol is entered or released and then implemented, I assume, sometime in Q3 or Q4 of this year, um, when that is implemented in our LISs, then I think that would be the time to change to H and uh, diagnosis, uh, again, to avoid confusion. Uh, one thing that I think we do need to do is report both total uh, total and invasive tumor size. I think we're planning here at UHN to do that, that uh, right diagnosis field, but include percentages of histologic subtypes for non mus adenocarcinomas, either in the microscopic description or in the comment field. Now, I know a lot of others are already doing this, but I think many are not. I think because we, invasive tumor size will, for many cases, become a calculated field, it'll be important of some documentation in the report of that calculation, and uh, really it's an indication of the percentage of histologic subtypes of, of carcinoma. And uh, I think the CAP protocol uh, next to it, uh, probably recognizes this, and, and that's why a field for additional subtypes was uh, included in the histologic type. Um, uh, fields. Okay, I think this is an important parameter, important params to, to include. And for the time being, uh, before we switch over completely to the eighth edition, I would suggest also providing the eighth edition TNM staging, uh, probably in the common field, uh, again to uh, prevent confusion. I uh, really clinicians who want to use the eighth edition. Uh, data for their clinical care can have that information readily available. Okay, so that really wraps up uh, my talk for today. So uh, just to recap, I've reviewed the lung cancer protocol, uh, really highlighted uh, potential changes in the upcoming up update. And uh, just again, this is what I presented is just from the draft protocol. There may be uh, changes between now and uh, this year when the final versions are set to be released. I've also reviewed the 8th edition of the TNM classification and uh, spent some time discussing potential impacts on, on staging of these tumors. To acknowledge uh, Dr. Kettner and uh, Mary Beth Beasley, uh, they did the share of, well, actually I guess they were the ones who were responsible for drafting this version 4.0 and it's, they've been very helpful uh, in uh, discussing some of these changes uh, with me uh, for this talk. I'd also like to thank uh, John Shrigley and Jim Brierley and Aaron Pollitt uh, just for their input in, into the uh, preparation of this talk as well. And again, thank uh, Cancer Care Ontario and Canadian Partnership Against Cancer for uh, sponsoring not just this talk, but the whole series. Okay, I think uh, we can move on to questions.
So if anyone has any questions, if they could just um, type in their questions in the chat, and what I'll do is um, I'll them out. Dr. Wang could respond to them. So the first question is from uh, Judith Zepfit. Um, Have there been any studies done on the reproductivity of the new methods? If, methods if tumor size of tumor if tumor size calculations, i.e., percentage of invasive tumor types multiplied by tumor size. Also, have there been any studies done to see how this method of calculating tumor size makes it survival? That's a good question. Uh, I'm not uh, completely familiar with this. Um, since I was you to uh, to that, uh, in the uh, in the process of doing a survival analysis for uh, the Eighth edition stage classifications, however, uh, I believe that, that they, as much as possible, try to use invasive tumor sizes, and so it seems that the prognosis correlates best with the invasive tumor size uh, when they were, um, I guess, preparing the edition and, and doing all the studies to uh, try to determine the, the size cutoffs. In terms of reproducibility, I, I think we all understand that that's going to be kind of all over the map. And something that um, is probably going to be a concern to, to many of us, and I'm very interested in in seeing those studies coming out uh, in few years, just to see kind of differences in stage. I mean, all of us, probably any of us, if we look at the same tumor on on two uh, days, uh we may come up with slightly different percentages. Uh, something that I do. Um, uh, just to check myself, you know, when I review cases with residents, you know, we'll give them you know, strategies to enter into the report and look at the tumor again when I'm signing it out. You know, sometimes I will change the proportions a little bit. I mean, oftentimes, uh, usually not more than you know, 10 or 5 percent. But uh, yeah, I think that that's going to be one of the things that we're going to have to be keeping our eyes on. But yeah, reproducibility will will be a real issue. Okay. Questions? Okay, the next question is from Dr. IP. Um and his question is how do you suggest we should sign out a lipidic predominant at carcinoma in needle biopsies? Should it be considered invasive? So if entirely lipidic in a needle core biopsy um, usually, I would just sign out, and uh, I, th I think this would be a uh, fairly standard practice would be to sign that out as adenocarcinoma with lipidic pattern. Uh, I would put in a comment that, that all uh, the only lipidic growth of the adenocarcinoma here, um, invasion cannot be exuded in small biopsy material. And they correlate with radiologic features. Uh, so, yeah, that out is adenocarcinoma with, with lipidic features or with lip growth. Okay, question is from Leon Widjako. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, and his question is <clears throat> Is PL1 and PL2 in the plural? Okay. Uh, thanks for that question. I, I didn't talk about PL1 and PL2 and, and PL3. Uh, so this is talking about uh, different levels of visceral pleural invasion, so PL0 being no visceral pleural invasion. Uh, PL1 is invasion through the elastica but not to the surface of the visceral pleura, whereas PL2 
would invasion to the surface of visceral pleura. PL3 would be invasion into the parietal pleura. So um, the new call specifies that PL1 and PL2, so in the visceral pleura, including invasion to the surface, <clears throat> would be considered still P2A, whereas P3, or invasion to the parietal pleura, uh, will be considered uh, T3. So no, no change there, but the checklist, I think, does specify that. Hope that's a question. Okay, next question is from Raymond Mong. Um, how do you report colon biopsies? What stains do you use for squamous versus adenocarcinoma? Uh, yeah, so for colon biopsies, um, if we are cut squamous cell carcinoma, um, like keratinization, intracellular bridges, uh, generally we don't do any complaints at all. Um, you know, we would probably just proceed to PDL1 testing. Uh, similar for clear cut adenocarcinoma, you know, there's well formed papillary or lipidic or acinar pattern. Um, and there's a PET scan showing that really that's the primary tumor and no other uh, so other tumors anywhere else. Um, I may not do TTF1. I mean, well, often I probably still would just to confirm, but I, I know many pathologists uh, would not, and I think that would be reasonable. Uh, poorly differentiated tumors, um, I typically do at least a TTF1 and a P40. If really not sure whether it's a carcinoma or not, I might throw in a pancaritin. And then I have a few unstained slides. Um, just for ALK and PDL1 testing, it does end up, up being a pulmonary uh, tumor. Uh, tend not to do uh, more images than that up front, just because it's getting more and more important to preserve tissue these days. Um, if the TTF and P40 and, and Pantin are all negative, I've already got some spares to do it in work up, uh, and I will at that point. But you you know, just the TF1 and P40 plus or minus a pan-keratin for more poorly differentiated tumors. Next question is from Ken Craddock. Um, in the case of two synchronous tumor nodules, both mixed histology adenocarcinomas, do you use the presence of lipidic pattern in one or both nodules to help favor synchronous primary versus metastasis? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, I mean, if the proportions of the subtypes are quite similar and the morphologic features are otherwise quite similar, and, you know, PIDIC is kind of a minor component, uh, I don't necessarily use that lipidic component to indicate that they're synchronous. Because I had no carcinomas, you know, even really the invasive types can show some lipidic growth. For lip, like well differentiated lipidic tumors where it's predominantly lipidic, uh, probably put that into the sort of multiple adenocarcinomas with lipidic category uh, uh, for tumor mortality, and generally I would consider those to be synchronous. For carcinoma in situ, that's one of the soft signs that people would use for uh, synchronous. But again, that's, uh, I don't think that's really hard and fast, necessarily. Oh, from Prashant Damaskar, how many sections one needs to, how many sections does one need to put larger tumor to assess the various histologic subtypes and the size of invasive component? Yeah, it's a good, good question. I don't think that there's specific guidelines on that. Uh, so, I mean, here we do sort of minimum of um, four blocks of tumor. So, smaller tumors, especially uh, if it's looking like it will be lipidic predominant or MIA, uh, we do try to submit the whole tumor if it's three centimeters or less. 
if it's more than three centimeters, um, then we would go a minimum of four blocks, and uh, uh, really we would follow one block per centimeter rule. Um, yeah, but I, that's our practice here. And I'm not sure that that's really uh, evidence-based. Okay, the next question is from Patricia Tai. If a tumor is purely lipidic, um, will it appear as a solid nodule in, in, in imaging or only ground glass hazy? Uh, will it appear as a solid nodule if a wedge resection growth specimen is assessed? Uh, okay, so radiologically, if it's pure lipidic, in general, unless there's something really strange going on, in, in general, uh, this would appear as pure ground glass nodules. Um, Parallel nodules, uh, invasive adenocarcinomas often would present um, as ground glass nodules, nodules with a small area lid component in the middle, and similarly lipidic adenocarcinomas. And uh, some lipologists uh, like Bill Travis would advocate correlating uh, what you're seeing your slides and, and grossly with the radiologic features. Uh, the, really, the solid components uh, in radiologically would tend to correspond with the invasive components logically and ground glass with lipidic. So there's a huge disconnect between what you're seeing microscopically and what you'd expect based on radiology. Uh, it would be worthwhile to kind of visit uh, criteria or, or maybe sample uh, the tumor more. Uh, in a west section of ground glass lesion, I mean, those can be very difficult to assess. And sometimes we end up having to put the entire through to be able to find it because they, they can be very difficult to see grossly. Uh, oftentimes, uh, those lesions may be more easy to feel than to see, uh, and particularly after fixation. But if you're cutting your specimen fresh, I mean, it can be very, very difficult to identify these lesions. For instance, time of frozen section. And if the surgeon isn't sure that they've gotten cognition, we had situations once in a while where uh, you know, has to have to go back and uh, you know, it's entirely clear that uh, they the lesion first time around. Well, that's actually the last question. Does anybody else have any questions that they would like to? Um, we can wait a couple minutes and see if there's any more questions. There's another question from Ken Craddock. Um, if there is uncertainty <clears throat> between synchronous primary versus metastasis, do you think do you think it's better to stage low or higher? So I think JCC guidelines say that when when there's doubt, uh, to go with the lower stage, and so that would tend to be our practice here. But then I would usually put in a comment that we can't completely exclude a metastatic lesion. So in those situations, I would stage as synchronous primaries, uh, but say that we can't exclude metastatic disease. There's no questions? Other question from um, Leanne, um, PD-1 testing. 
do it all non cell sorry, let's do it again. Do you do it in all non small cell carcinomas include include squat? Uh, yeah, good good question. Uh, at present we are. Um because they're ending for P D L one testing right now through through a pharma company. Um probably for the next six to eight months. After that, I guess it'll depend on uh, provincial agencies are willing to fund reflex testing. Uh, but yes, we do uh, testing both on squamous and non-squamous, non-small cell carcinomas. Uh, I think probably there's a case to be made for um, risk testing just because um, the data coming out uh, just I think about two or three months ago showing that um, in the first line setting in, in advanced non small carcinomas, the PDL1 inhibitor was uh, superior to conventional chemotherapy. So I think it'll be important for oncologists to have that uh, information available uh, in, in first line setting. So, as uh, so we are currently testing in, in all non small cell carcinomas. No additional questions. Um, I guess we could turn it over to Dr. Shrigley. Much um, on behalf of the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, Cancer Care Ontario, and the Canadian Association of Pathologists, I really want to thank David for a really excellent, clear presentation today. Uh, David, your contribution to this KTE program across the country is really greatly appreciated. As a reminder, both the live and recorded presentations are eligible for CME credits. Uh, in order to get them, to request your certificate of participation, pre please provide your name and email address at the link included in the session notice. Uh, here you will find the optional session evaluation form, which we encourage you to complete. The information collected through this process allows us to ensure that these sessions continue to be informative and relevant to your practice. We appreciate your comments and suggestions. Please see the session notice for more information. A reminder, everybody, of our upcoming sessions. So uh, on February the 8th, we have an invasive uh, uh, breast uh, session. Dr. Penny Barnes from Nova Scotia. Uh, Jim Breyer is going to give us a general update on TNM8 on February the 15th. Uh, Tony Ng from Vancouver on the 22nd of February is going to talk about thyroid. Uh, Dr. Dina L. Delawi is going to be talking about uh, Ewing's and PNAT. This, is, this session is sponsored in part by the Pediatric Oncology Group of Ontario. And finally, yours truly will give you an update, a long-awaited long, uh, long update on prostate checklist on May the 29th. That's it for this session. Thank you very much for your attendance. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you.